Well, it's cold outside, but warm inside, and as Pastor Collins was saying, minus 35. I think they were uh, uh, calculating or predicting something like minus 55. I don't know. The coldest I've ever experienced was minus 65 degrees. I think that day was colder than Mars. And that was in Alberta when my wife and I, oh, we're in Winnipeg. Okay, when we're in Winnipeg. And uh, my God is good. He's always with us, and he keeps us warm. And uh, Andre, if you could please do me a favor and put up my PowerPoint when you get a chance there. Our sermon title for today is Making the Most of 2017. And we are literally a day and a half away from 2018. So why don't we have a word of prayer as we open up today, shall we? Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to hear a word from you. Lord, I pray that you may take over, that we may hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we look back in the previous year, we can sure say that a lot has happened in 2017, hasn't it? If we look around the world events that have happened this past year, we can say that the world is quickly changing, isn't it? quickly deteriorating, quickly culminating to some kind of climax. Everything is building up to the climax of Jesus' second coming. But let's take a moment to look at some, a synopsis briefly of what happened in 2017. Canada, of course, celebrated its 150th birthday. Then, of course, there was Queen Elizabeth who celebrated her Sapphire Jubilee on February 6th marking 65 years of reign. She is the longest reigning monarch in British history. And Queen Elizabeth II was the first British monarch to have a sapphire jubilee. Then, of course, we all remember on August 21, the solar eclipse that happens. Perhaps you had the opportunity to go outside and, and witness it for yourself. But on August 21, the solar eclipse was the first solar eclipse visible for the entire continental U.S. and Canada since 1919. Then, of course, we also had the Women's March, which was the longest, the largest single-day demonstration in U.S. history, which estimated between 3 to 5 million people came out and advocated for women's rights, immigration reform, and reproduction rights gathered together. Then, of course, we also know the wonderful liquidation sales of Sears, right? That huge giant of a Canadian company has gone under and has liquidated. And we seem to celebrate because we're getting great sales, but we also need to remember there was 15,000 employees that went out of work because of it. 15,000. Now, if we keep looking back, let's look at some world events. North Korea and American relations are strained after nearly two dozen test missiles were launched by Kim Jong-un and words of war are being exchanged between Trump and President Kim Jong-un. Trump also signed a travel ban to suspend all refugee admissions and temporarily ban people from several Muslim countries for 90 days. Maybe you'll remember this in the news. The travel ban for Muslim people banned sparked mass protest and outrage during that time, all of which was this year. And in London, there were two uncoordinated terrorist attacks um, that struck the capital less than three months apart. March 22nd, a man plowed his car into several pedestrians, killing four and injuring 50. Then on June 3rd, a van plowed into a crowd of pedestrians before Three assailants leaped out and stabbed nearby pedestrians, killing eight people. We live in a messed up world, don't we? Some crazy things have happened in 2017. Then there was, of course, the May 22nd suicide bomber that detonated an explosive outside an Ariana Grande concert, killing 22 people and injuring 50. The youngest victim was eight years old. Then there was, of course, five people killed after a gunman opened fire at the Fort Lauderdale, and that's actually him right there, the Fort Lauderdale Airport on, June, on January 6th. 
Another shooter opened fire on the First Baptist Church in Texas, killing 26 people and injuring 20. Victims range from 72 to 18 months old. In a church. Shooting in Las Vegas on October 29th, killing 59, injuring more than 515. Then, of course, there's the natural disasters that also happened in 2017. Hurricane Irma ripped through the Caribbean and southern United States as a Category 5 storm, leaving 134 dead and causing damage worth in more than $100 billion. It was the longest-lived Atlantic storm since 2004. All of this has been happening this last year, this year. Hurricane Harvey per Houston underwater, leaving 82 people dead and causing damages nearly $200 billion worth. And of course, we heard of the natural disaster that happened in Puerto Rico, a huge state of crisis after Hurricane uh, Maria pummeled the island with a Category 4 storm on September 20th. And for months later, they were struggling to still have clean drinking water, to have access to clean drinking water. And of course, there was central Mexico. On September 19, a powerful 7.1 magnitude earthquake killed 370 people across the region. Two weeks earlier, an 8.1 magnitude hit the same coast in Chia Chia Chiapas, Mexico, on September 7th, killing 98 people. And there's so many more of these natural disasters. And I can't help but remember a verse that comes to mind, a certain prophecy that scripture has declared in Matthew 24, 6 to 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. You see, brothers and sisters, only God knows the details of the future. But we all know the big picture of what's going to happen. Amen? We know and are guaranteed by his promises all throughout scripture that Jesus Christ is coming back to take us home and we will live an eternity with him. Where there will be no more shootings, no more earthquakes, no more disasters, no more pain and all these things that we've experienced throughout this past year. And yet as true as that is, none of us really know the details of what's going to happen in this coming 2018 year, do we? Only God knows the great, the marvelous, the joyous, and perhaps even the sad and heartbreaking incidents that will occur in 2018. And even though we don't know exactly what will happen, I want us to remember one thing. That we do have the power to choose how we act or react to what is given us in 2018. What I want us to understand is that we have the power to choose our actions and our reactions to what goes on in the next year. And when we put this um, advice given to us by Paul in Ephesians in this kind of context, we can see the application today. In Ephesians 5, it was read for a scripture reading, Ephesians 5, verse 15 to 17. The Apostle Paul writes, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of what? Time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so I ask, how do we make the most of the little time that we have? How do we make the most of of 2018, after all, being only one day away. And so this morning I prepared for you two simple suggestions as to how we can make this year a year to remember. Two suggestions of how to make the most of the following year as well. See, the first recommendation of how to make the most of 2018 is something that seems quite simple, yet is maybe not as simple as it sounds. And the first suggestion I have for making the most of 2017 and 2018 is prioritizing. Prioritizing. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But many of us, including myself, have a hard time setting and keeping our priorities, don't we? You see, here's the shocking truth. And maybe you can take your, your smartphones out for me and, and take out your calculator app. We're going to do a little bit of math this morning, shall we? 
Take out your phone, your smartphone, and, and, and let's see if we can calculate together here. Here's the shocking math. Since 2017 and also 2018 are not leap years, there are 365 days in that one year. So type in 365. Now there's 24 hours in one day, right? So times the two together. We have approximately 8,760 hours in 2018. Now how many of those hours are actually usable hours? Well, the average person sleeps about eight hours a day. So if you do take that into calculation, we're left with approximately 5,840 hours in 2018. I hope I didn't butcher the math up here, but that's how I calculated. 5,840 hours in 2018. It seems like a lot, right? I mean, 5,000 hours. But let's take into account also to 40, uh, the average 40 hours that each of us spend on a work week or in school per day. You're left with approximately 3,760 hours after that. And that's based on five days of work. Then take into account the studies showing that an average person spends about the average of five hours per day in front of a screen. So how much time is really left? If you take that into calculation, you're then left with only 1,935 hours in 2018. Somewhat usable hours. Only 1,900 hours kind of puts it into perspective, doesn't it? And if we look around us, most of us are very busy these days, aren't we? We're always in a hurry to be somewhere, to do something, or, or to get something done before we run out of time, and before it's too late. I mean, isn't it true that we pray fast, we walk fast, we talk fast, we run fast, and after we're done eating fast, we often say, excuse me, I've got to run. And so let me take a quick moment to remind us of what our top priorities should be looking like. Number one, our top priority is, of course, needs to be our relationship with the one and only man in this cosmos that truly matters the most, Jesus Christ. You see, our top priority in life needs to be building upon our relationship with Christ. If we went, enter into 2018, if we even leave here today not prioritizing our relationship with him, then we've done ourselves an injustice. You see, if our top priority isn't the Lord, then how can we truly understand what the Lord wants us to do? Let me remind each and every single one of us that compared to anyone in our lives or anything or anyone that may come into our lives, Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father, is the only one that matters the most. Our relationship with Jesus is more important than our relationship with our siblings, more important than our relationship with our spouses, and even more important than our relationship with our kids. Our relationship with Jesus is more important than anything else in this world. That's why... It says in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And in Luke 14.33, Therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. You see, the truth is that some of us have Jesus as our last or second to last priority, and we don't even realize it, do we? Or perhaps many of us are lying to ourselves, making ourselves believe that it's okay because, well, Jesus wants us to take care of our families, to take care of our needs and everything else that's going on. And so we lie to ourselves thinking that it's okay to put Jesus second. But it's time for us to realize and accept what the Holy Spirit has been trying to teach us for so long, that our relationship with Jesus is of the uttermost importance. Jesus needs to be that top priority. And so the simple question I have for you is, of the 1,935 hours left in 2018 to come, how much of that will you be spending with Jesus? How much of your usable time, how much of that time in the next year will you be using for Jesus? That's our first priority. The second priority that needs to be placed as second in our lives is actually us. Now you may... Think, well, well, Pastor, that sounds kind of selfish, doesn't it? 
how do we place our sec- ourselves as second in priority? Now, now, I know it may sound weird, and yes, the Bible does teach us to not be selfish and to consider others and not be haughty, and I'm not contradicting it at all. But let me put it this way. If we ourselves are a big mess emotionally, physically, and spiritually, how can we possibly take care and bless others? To help illustrate it, let me illustrate it like this. How can a firefighter go into a burning building and take out a 200-pound man or woman out of a burning building if he or she has not taken the time to prepare him or herself for that event? Men, how can you truly fulfill your God-ordained duty of being the spiritual head of your house if you're not being selfish and spending alone time with God? Do we see the correlation there? Ladies, how can you live out your your calling to be the bride of Christ if you don't spend time with your man Jesus? Or, or, Or mothers, how can you lead and teach your child in the ways of the Lord if you yourselves aren't in the Lord, if you aren't being selfish and spending alone time with God. You see, what I mean by putting yourself second in priority is making sure that you've got your head right with Jesus. And it relates back to priority number one, of course. Then the third priority that has to be placed is our spouse. Too many times we put our spouse as last or second to last, and too many people put their kids ahead of their marriage. And it may sound like the proper thing to do, but let me propose to you the idea that it's not the wisest thing to do. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about going out and buying your husband or your wife that that wonderful plasma TV they've been wanting and and starving your children of of their college funds and tuition and things of that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that I believe that our children should know that our relationship with our spouse is of the utter importance after Jesus. You see, our children need to see proper priorities exemplified in the lives of their parent or parents. And of course, then that brings us to our fourth priority that needs to be placed in order as well, our family and our kids. And here's what I mean by prioritizing our children. And I'm going to be blunt with you because I feel so saddened when I see parents making the sad mistake of believing that they can simply leave it up to the church or the school or the youth pastor to teach what the parents need to be teaching their kids at home. Now, now don't get me wrong. I'm not putting every parent under this umbrella. I'm not saying that all parents are doing this. But I see it far too often where parents don't give their kids the time of the day at home but then complain when they see their child has left the church into drugs and other foolishness. And so we need to make sure that we give our kids the time of the day, don't we? We need to make sure that they know that they are our priority. Amen? I'm learning that myself with two little ones. And sometimes I mess up in my priorities. But I always have to remember that my kids have to know how important they are to me. See, I think it's time that we stop allowing media and others around us to dictate how we set our priorities. And there's so many demands on our time, so many good things that need to be done, but there's only hours, so many hours in the day. And who knows if we'll actually have all of those hours. You know, I like how Ellen White put it when she was talking about time. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 342, she said, Our time belongs to God. Every moment is his, and we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it to his glory. Of no talent he has given will he require a more strict account than of our time. And so how are we spending our time? Do we want to make the most of every opportunity? But the only way we're going to be able to do that this next year is if we set our priorities right, if we cling to them and never change them. Now, setting our priorities in order for 2018 will make it somewhat more of a more successful year, right? 
But my second recommendation for making the most of 2017 and 2018 has to be illustrated with photography. Now let me illustrate what I mean by that. Now, one of my favorite hobbies is photography. I've grown up to really enjoy photography. And so I have here a camera lens and two camera bodies. Now, there's two, to basically uh, simplify photography, it has to be simplified saying this, that photography is the art of painting with light. And to simplify it even further, there's so many lenses that you can get for a camera, but there's basically two main types of lenses. There's your telephoto lens, which I have here. This allows you to zoom right into the minutest details of a subject. All you see is the, the, the details of the feathers in a bird, or the details of, of the teeth on a, on a lion yawning when you're hundreds of feet away. And so this allows you to zoom right in and all you see is that subject matter, that certain subject that you're trying to draw attention to. That's all you see. You don't see the context around that subject. All you see is that subject. And so this type of lens is typically used for nature photography, um, for portraits even, and uh, oftentimes for sport photography. Now, I obviously don't have that kind of lens. If you look, uh, if you're ever watching a sports game, you'll see all those camera guys on the sidelines with these massive lenses that are about $20,000 per, per lens. They're like this big. Anyways. And so those lenses are specifically for zooming right into the action and only seeing the subject. Then the second lens that you have is the, the wide angle lens. Now this lens is very unique because it can be used to gather a very wide angle of view. This gives you the whole picture. So for example, at a wedding, when you're shooting the family and the bride and all the guests, you need a wide angle lens so that you see everybody that is involved at that event. It's also used for um, realty, home sales, photography, when you want to picture the whole house and get the whole angle of view. That lens will provide you with the context of the situation rather than just the one subject that you may be looking for. And you may be asking yourselves, well, what in the world does this have to do with making the most of 2017? Let me share with you. You see, 2017 is just about over and today is December 30th, only a day and a half away until the end. And I don't know what your year looked like and I don't know what 2017 looked like for you and your families but for many, many of us here today, 2017 brought many beautiful and amazing gifts from God that need to be celebrated and praised. Amen? For instance, the birth of many beautiful children that we have in this church perhaps occurred in 2017. Or perhaps 2017 brought other great things for you and your family. Maybe that, that promotion at work or, or perhaps 2017 brought that job that you have been needing for so long. Perhaps, maybe in 2017, brought you and your family the beautiful and blessed gift of being in Canada, a country that I've loved, come to love and appreciate. But before we leave this year and close this year, I want us to take a moment for ourselves to look back upon this year and to seek to celebrate the many blessings God has bestowed upon us and our family and be sure to give God the praise that he deserves for that. Now, at the same time, things do happen, and there have been many things in 2017 that, that we need to celebrate and be grateful for, but unfortunately, there are some other difficult and sad, mournful moments in 2017 as well. This year, some within our church had to sadly bury their loved ones, mourn their mother, their father, their grandmother, their, their grandfather, their sister, or their brother, and they're still mourning them today, and for that, I'm deeply sorry for your loss. And not only your loss, but our loss. Because we're a family here, amen? You see, God himself continues to mourn with you, to cry with you, and most importantly, to hold you in his caring arms. 
And remember that he never wanted you to experience any of these negative things in 2017. But instead, he wants you to go to him for the comfort, the love, and the care that only he can provide. And some, even within this church family here today, had to or is continuing to endure sickness, disease, or some other terrible and painful physical ailment. I know of, of some who have concer- conquered cancer in 2017, and for that I say congratulations. I also know some who are living in fear of cancer returning to wreak havoc on their bodies. And I also know some who are fighting what seems like a quickly ending battle of pain and suffering. And I also know some who are still living with brain tumors, my wife being one of them. Someone who is living with pain and arthritis. I know that there are some living in pain and recovery from surgery or a fear of an upcoming surgery. My grandfather being one of them. You see, I don't know what 2017 looked like for you. Because 2017 may have brought very many different things for you. But whatever 2017 may have brought you, I want to suggest to you a humble thought that we use the right lens for the right picture. That we use the right lens for the right picture. You see, for many of us, we keep using or are stuck using the telephoto lens, the zoom lens, in which all we see is the struggle, all we see is the situation, all we see is the the details of that pain, of that struggle that we're going through. All we see is our situation, our circumstance. But I have a humble suggestion that that we've just for a moment grab the wide-angle lens and look at the greater context of the great controversy that is going on around us today. Look at the greater context of, of, of being able to see what Jesus sees, of seeing his second coming and realizing that this isn't our home. You see, Jesus, he sees the, the wider picture. He sees the context of the struggle, this fight between good and evil, this fight between God and the devil and Lucifer. You see, where we, where all we can see is our defeated state, Jesus sees us conquering. You see, the devil has, defe- has been defeated, and while we continue to fight this fight a little while longer, Jesus sees the one more soul that he longs to save. And here we are, we're we're seeing our problem, and we're praying and hoping that the end will come. But Jesus sees the wider picture and says, hang on. I have yet to save one more. I have yet to save one more. And so may I suggest that we put down the zoom lens and look through the wide lens, seeing the greater picture that Jesus wants us to see. Because here, where we see a coffin, Jesus sees the resurrection. Where we see pain and physical ailment, Jesus sees the recreation of new, perfect, and sin-free bodies. Where we see hospital beds full of, of, of blood, tears, suffering, and pain, Jesus sees the throne in which we will be sharing with him. Where we see the chains of guilt and remorse for addictions, for wrongs, for sins committed, Jesus sees the cross where chains are broken and freedom is exchanged for a crown of thorns. Where we see worthlessness, Jesus sees righteousness. Where we see brokenness, he sees the wholeness to come. Where we see children in pain, neglect, and abuse, he sees children growing, leaping, and playing with lions in the safety of his home one day soon. Where we only see our problem, he sees the solution. For he is the solution. It is time that we look through the wider ends, look through the lens in which Jesus asks us to look through. Let us look back at 2017 with the wider angle lens, seeing what God is doing in our lives, looking at it through the picture of the great controversy in which we continue to fight. The context as well of the great hope in which we all have of Jesus coming again. Amen? You see, like I was saying, it's now December 30th. And will we look back at 2017 with regret and remorse? Will we next year look back at 2018 with regret and remorse? Or will we set our priorities right? 
Will we look at our lives with the context in which Jesus sees our lives? Have we been solely focusing on our problems and our situations? You see, someone once wise, someone wise once said, life is what happens to you while you're making plans to do something else. Isn't it so true? Life is what happens to you while you're making plans to do something else. And another year is just around the corner. And so I feel impressed to end today's message with a simple appeal. I feel impressed to give each and every one of us an opportunity an opportunity to mark this last Sabbath of 2017, to close 2017 with our heart, minds, and bodies completely surrendered to Jesus. You see, we can be going into 2018 with our priorities straight because it's so important. We can be going into 2018 with the wider lens of the great controversy, of the greater picture of Jesus' return. But closing 2017 and walking into 2018 with our lives completely surrendered to Jesus, is the only thing that will guarantee us any sort of success in the year. Walking into 2018 completely surrendered to Jesus is what will guarantee us that Jesus will hold us in his arms. And I was driving down the road the other day and I was listening to the Christian radio. And as I was listening to it, a song I really like came on. It's called Forgiven by David Crowderband. I don't know if you've ever heard it before or not, but I want to read to you the lyrics today. And I want you to picture yourself saying these things to Jesus. He says, I'm the one who held the nail. It was cold between my fingertips. I've hidden in the garden. I've denied you with my very lips. God, I fall down to my knees with a hammer in my hand. You look at me, arms open. Forgiven, forgiven. Child, there is freedom from all of it. Say goodbye to every sin. You are forgiven. I've done things I wish I hadn't done. I've seen things I wish I hadn't seen. Just the thought of your amazing grace. And I cry, Jesus, forgive me. God, I fall down to my knees with a hammer in my hand. You look at me, arms open. Forgiven, forgiven. Child, there is freedom from all of it. Say goodbye to every sin. You are forgiven. I could have been six feet under. I could have been lost forever. Yeah, I should be in that fire. But now there is fire inside of me. Here I am, a dead man walking. No grave going to hold God's people. All the weight of, all, of our evil lifted away forever free. Who could believe? Who could believe? Forgiven. Forgiven. You love me even when I don't deserve it. Forgiven. I'm forgiven. Jesus, your blood makes me innocent. So I will say goodbye to every sin. I am forgiven. Forgiven. Child, there is freedom for all of it. Say goodbye to every sin. You are forgiven. Aren't those words absolutely beautiful? Are those words forgiven marked on your hearts today? Today, do you want to walk into 2018 knowing that you are forgiven? Don't you want to walk into 2018 with the assurance of salvation? Because you've completely surrendered to him? You see, Romans 13, 11 verse, and 12 says, The hour has come for you to, to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. The hour of our salvation is here. And so this morning, is there anyone here that wants to experience the amazing grace of Christ? Is there anyone here this morning that wants to walk into 2018, that wants to close 2017, giving their hearts and minds completely to Jesus? If so, I have a simple appeal for you to, to come on forward because we're going to pray for you. I know I'm challenging you to, to, to get up out of your seats. But I want you to make that public commitment to Jesus that you are surrendering everything to him. And that you're going to start this next year with a right heart, completely surrendered to him. If you'd like to do that this morning, I invite you to make that public 
stands today. Come on forward. I want to pray with you. Amen. If you want to say, well, Lord Jesus, I know that I've been prioritizing many other things besides you this year. And Lord, I know that we are forgiven. And so I want to invite you this morning to say, yes, Lord, I want to give you my heart completely. I want to walk into this next year completely consecrated to you because I am forgiven. I am forgiven. This morning, if you want to give your life to Christ, I invite you to stand and come on forward if you can. If you can't come forward, then please just stand where you are. And make that public declaration to him, to Jesus, saying, you have my all. I surrender all to you. Let's start 2018 right, amen? Let's start it with our hearts completely consecrated to Christ. Because he is our salvation. Heavenly Father, you know the different things that have occurred in 2017. Father God, you know the different pains and the struggles that each and every one of us have experienced. But you also know the joys and the wonderful things that you have given us through this year. Father God, for all these things, we leave them in your hands. And you see each and every one of us here this morning up front making that declaration that we want to completely surrender this year, completely surrender ourselves into your arms. Father God, each and every one of us here standing before you want to say, yes, Lord, I want to give you my life completely and start this year off right. Lord, we want to make sure that we prioritize you in our lives. We want to make sure that we are able to see everything that happens in the context of the great controversy, in the context of you coming back to take us home. And so, Father God, we pray, Lord, that you may take us as we are. For you have us all holy. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite us to go back to our pews and sing together number 547. I want to invite our choristers to lead us through a song of Be Thou My Vision, number 547.
And so my prayer for each and every one of us is that may 2018 bring you enough happiness to keep you sweet, enough trials to keep you strong, enough sorrow to keep you human, enough hope to keep you happy, enough failure to keep you humble, and enough success to keep you eager, enough friends to give you comfort, enough wealth to meet your basic needs, enough enthusiasm to make you look forward to tomorrow, and enough determination to make each day better than the day before. Amen. May God bless us all as we strive towards a closer walk with him. Have a happy new year, and I pray that you may make the most of 2018.